genius, you'd believe her. Yes, I would. Now, George, I think Josie is right in believing Mrs. Baker. She's a lovely person and a very good teacher. All the kids at school like her. Hey, Dad, here's something for my report. Oh, well, what's that, George? Only the grown people have clothes on. Say, Mom, can I wear this skirt tomorrow? Yes, Josie. I've almost finished hemming it. It says here that until they were 12 or 13 years old, the children wore no clothes at all. The wearing of loincloths and skirts was considered a sign of sexual maturity. Well, that's interesting, George. And it ties in with the film Josie was telling us about. Sure does. We saw that film last year. I'm on the preview committee, Dad. I'm going to tell the class what to look for in the film. Well, have you decided what you're going to say? I'm going to tell them that the most important things to look for are the changes that take place in our bodies and feelings when we grow up. Grow up? That is, when we become adolescents. We've used that word adolescent before. Who can tell us what it means? Dorothy? Well, it's boys and girls just beginning to mature. It happens when they're about our age. That's right, Dorothy. Are there any other points from the preview committee? Yes, Mrs. Baker. Warren has a list of questions we'd like to project for the class to see. That's good. Go right ahead, Warren. John, would you put out the front lights, please? When does human growth begin? How much does one grow before birth? Do boys and girls grow at the same rate? What are the main growth changes that occur during childhood and adolescence? The committee did very well. The film we'll see this morning will give the answers to these questions. It will also show the earliest phases of growth, as well as the changes that take place during childhood and adolescence. It will help you to understand the way the cycle of human growth is repeated over and over, from generation to generation. And now we're ready for the film. Lights. When we talk about growth, we usually think of growing up. But the long road of growth is not just up. If it were, it would mean that this little baby would someday look like this. Now, let's see how human beings really grow. Here are two average babies, a little boy and a little girl. In the course of a few years, they will reach maturity. During the first three years, growth is very rapid. The boy and girl become twice as tall and five times as heavy as they were at birth. By the age of six, they have added still more height and weight. Notice that the boy is a little bigger than the girl. At nine, arms, legs, and trunks have become long and slender, giving the body a slim appearance. At about this age, the girl grows more rapidly than the boy. By 12 or 13, the average girl is taller and heavier than the boy, and she looks more mature. At 15, the girl's growth slows down, while usually the boy keeps on growing rapidly for another year or two. When they reach their late teens or early 20s, they are fully mature people 
with the boy again being appreciably larger than the girl. By comparing the adult with the child, we can see the growth changes more clearly. Notice that the adult face and head are less round, and the arms, legs, and trunk relatively longer. The boy's shoulders are broad and his body muscular, while the girl's body is more curved. Thus we see that growth is more than just growing up. The form of the body changes as well. Growth is controlled by tiny organs called glands within our bodies. One of the most important of these is the pituitary gland located in the head. It secretes chemicals into our blood. The chemicals are called hormones and they regulate body growth. The pituitary hormone influences the secretions of other glands, notably the testes and ovaries, located in the pelvic region of the body. The testes secrete the male sex hormone and the ovaries the female sex hormone. Presence of these hormones in the blood brings about many changes in the bodies of both boys and girls. and in the way they feel and act, too. For boys, hair begins to grow on the face. For both boys and girls, hair grows under the arms, in the pubic region, and elsewhere on the body. The breasts of the girl begin to develop. The vocal cords of both boys and girls get larger and their voices deepen. These physical changes make the boy feel more manly and the girl more womanly. Both feel independent. They begin to be interested in members of the other sex, in social activities, and in being together. These are normal feelings. In addition to hormones, the testes and ovaries produce the male and female sex cells from which we all have our beginnings. The male cell, or sperm cell, is so small it can be seen only with a microscope. When we magnify the sperm cell many times, we see the head containing the nucleus and the tail that wiggles and causes the cell to move. The female cell, or ovum, while larger than the sperm, is still no bigger than a pinpoint. By enlarging the ovum many times, we can see the cell wall and the disc-like nucleus. When the sperm from the father unites with the ovum from the mother, growth begins. The nucleus of each sex cell contains the genes and chromosomes which determine the heredity of the child, his resemblance to his parents and other characteristics. When a boy is between the ages of 13 and 16, the testes begin to produce sperm cells. These sperm cells are carried through the tubes in a thick, colorless liquid called semen, and at certain times are expelled through the penis. This happens during mating and sometimes during dreams in sleep. This is a normal function of the body. In addition to the ovaries, the sex organs of the girl consist of the tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. When a girl is between the ages of 12 and 15, the ovaries begin to produce ova, or egg cells. About once every month, an ovum ripens and leaves the ovary moving into the tube. While the ovum moves slowly along the tube, the uterus becomes richly supplied with blood to nourish the egg. But if the ovum doesn't meet a sperm cell, it fails to grow and is discharged. Some days later, the uterus sheds its lining and a little blood passes from the body. The bleeding decreases and in a few days stops completely. This process is called menstruation. The whole cycle begins again with another ovum ripening, usually in the opposite ovary. During early adolescence, the menstrual cycle may be quite irregular.
it usually takes a year or two for a rhythm to become established. These functions begin as we attain sexual maturity. But all of us do not mature at the same age. These boys and girls, for example, are all 13 years old. Yet among them, we see many differences in size and maturity. These differences and the fact that girls usually mature earlier than boys, both physically and emotionally, sometimes create problems. But by the time boys and girls reach their late teens, these problems will have been solved. Also, by the time they have completed their education, have steady jobs, want to get married, and are ready to accept the responsibility of having and raising children, the differences in sexual maturity will have disappeared. Human growth can begin only when the sperm cells of the father during mating pass from the penis into the vagina of the mother. The sperm cells use their thread-like tails to move into the uterus and tube. If the sperm cells meet an ovum and one sperm succeeds in breaking through the cell wall, fertilization occurs. The nucleus of the sperm joins with the nucleus of the ovum and growth begins. The fertilized ovum begins to divide into many cells while moving along the tube to the uterus. There it attaches itself to the inner lining. Drawing its nourishment from the blood of the mother, it continues to grow and in a month looks like this. At two months it is much bigger and is already beginning to look like a baby. You can see the cord which connects the baby to the mother and through which the baby receives its nourishment and oxygen. The uterus, which is normally not much bigger than a fist, is muscular and elastic enough to expand to many times its normal size. At four months, you can already see why this expansion is necessary. The baby now has arms and legs that move inside the mother. By six months, the baby has gradually turned to this head down position in preparation for birth. The baby is very active now. It is not only the uterus that expands to accommodate the growing baby. Here you can see how the whole abdominal wall stretches. This baby has developed for nine months and is about to be born. If the mother were lying down, this would be the position of the baby just before birth. You can see the mother's spine below the enlarged uterus. The head settles to a lower position and the muscles of the uterus begin to force the baby out. The muscle walls of the vagina expand to make room and the baby's head begins to move out of the mother. The doctor lends a helping hand and the new baby meets the outside world. Since the baby no longer has to depend upon its mother's blood for food and oxygen, the doctor ties and cuts the cord. The baby cannot feel the cutting any more than you can feel it when the barber cuts your hair. Growth continues, and this baby will become a full-grown boy or girl, and eventually a father or a mother, thus continuing the cycle of human growth. Light, please. The principles of growth and development we've seen in this film apply to all human beings. Now let's begin our discussion by answering the first question from the preview committee. Who can tell us when human growth begins? Bill? Growth begins when a sperm cell enters an egg cell. 
Suppose the sperm cell doesn't enter the egg cell. Then the egg isn't fertilized, then it dies in a few days. That's correct, Bill. Steve, do you have a question? Well, it's sort of a silly question, but I was wondering why there are so many sperm cells and only one egg cell. That's a very good question, Steve. Let's use the projector to explain it. Now, in the first place, remember that the male sperm cells are being produced all the time, while only one egg cell is produced each month. That's one reason there are so many more sperm cells than egg cells. Then see what would happen if there were only one or a few sperm cells. The ovum is produced here and moves into the tube. The sperm cell has to travel all the way up here to find the ovum. And if there weren't so many of them, the chances of the ovum meeting a sperm cell would be small. Light, please. Does that answer your question, Steve? Yes, Mrs. Baker. Are there other questions? Julie? About menstruation, is it really normal for the body to bleed like that? Completely normal, Julie. Remember in the animated film, the lining of the uterus became filled with blood with which to nourish the fertilized ovum. Well, when the ovum is not fertilized, there's no need for this nourishment. So the uterus merely sheds its inner lining, and naturally a little blood leaves the body at the same time. Oh, I see. Now for the questions the rest of you have. Carolyn? Do boys have anything like menstruation? I heard my mother tell a neighbor I was born cesarean. What does that mean? Why don't all people have red hair? What happens if more than one sperm cell enters an egg? How long will it take till my voice changes? Are girls always bigger than boys at 12 or 13? Why do some kids grow faster than others? I'd like to know more about different kinds of hormones. Everybody says I look like my Aunt Sarah. Why do I have to look like her when I don't even like her? <laughs> All of those are excellent questions. You students who've been watching this film, you've heard the questions we're going to discuss. You can discuss these same questions with your teacher, and you can ask any others you have in mind. <laughs>